Over my two weeks traveling Palestine, I was witness to the true impact of the devastating refugee crisis. Countless who fled violence and persecution are banned from ever returning. Today, nearly 70% of all Palestinians are refugees. There was a shockwave of two mass expulsions by Israeli forces. The nearly 800,000 in the Nakba in 1948, when over 500 villages were ethnically cleansed, then another 300,000 in the 1967 war but that number only continued to grow. Today, there are more than seven million displaced Palestinians worldwide. Most fled to neighboring Arab countries as refugees. The United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees, known as UNRWA, tracks the dire refugee situation where there are the highest concentrations. Thousands more are unregistered. In Lebanon, UNRWA has registered 425,000 Palestinian refugees. Syria houses over 425,000 as well. Jordan, which shares its greatest border, is home to 1.9 million Palestinian refugees. But with those shockingly large refugee populations, an even larger number of Palestinians are internally displaced. More than 2.2 million Palestinians are refugees in their own country, blocked in violation of international law from returning to the land they live just miles away from, packed into camps. These camps experienced the highest rates of poverty and unemployment. In 1950, the UN temporarily leased land to create the first tent cities for Palestinian refugees who were internally displaced. Eventually, the UN replaced their tents with concrete boxes. They were tiny structures with tin roofs where people were packed, sweltering in the blazing heat. Today, within the state of Israel, over 300,000 remain as displaced Palestinians. In the West Bank, nearly 800,000 people are UN-registered refugees. But even greater, an unconscionable 1.1 million refugees are packed into the tiny, caged Gaza Strip, completely blocked by Israel from leaving. According to the United Nations Resolution 194, issued after the Nakba in 1948, the Israeli government must allow the refugees to return to their homes with compensation for their suffering. But Israel, to this day, remains in violation of this UN resolution, denying their right to return. While the Gaza Strip is a completely walled-off prison by the Israeli state, it is no longer under military occupation. However, the Palestinians in the West Bank camps are. Not only do they suffer as refugees, but they're also subjected to a violent military occupation by the very same forces who made them refugees in the first place. Today, Balata is the biggest and most densely populated refugee camp in the West Bank. Most of the people here were expelled from Haifa, Yaffa, and Jenin, all ethnically cleansed by the Israeli army. Balata has served as a hotbed of resistance to the occupation, and Israeli forces attack the entire camp often as collective punishment. I was shown around by British-born Palestinian Nancy Lansour. In 1935, her great-grandfather was shot in the head by Jewish settlers when they seized his home. She took me through the dense maze of warehoused refugees. So um, this is, yeah, these are basically streets, right? Yeah. So you know when they came here in 1951, uh, they came and they got tents, and it was, they rented this land, or the UN rented this land for them from the people that live in the city of Nablus. And so, uh, a couple of years later, the UN come and give them two stone houses per family. So, for example, in Bethlehem, um, in Dehisha refugee camp, there's a family that uh, had two stone rooms until up until two years ago. We went to visit them, and they had seven kids and themselves. So you're thinking about a bathroom, a kitchen. Um, I mean, and they built a bathroom because usually they had public bathrooms out here. <coughs> so it was like you know, 
uh, two rooms, usually your kitchen and your front room and then a bedroom for everybody. So it's, you can only imagine, like, mm -hmm. you know, we complain about the spaces mm -hmm. we have in New York, but uh, this is a little crazier. And so as you can see, it just gets more and more dense and overpopulated. Um, and I think actually the, the, the exact number is 28,000 refugees. So this is the biggest refugee camp, and it's literally one kilometre by one kilometre. So, in a space like this, you could imagine the Israelis are already scared. So they get, you know, they don't, they get really scared of coming in here unless they're coming like three, four hundred deep. You know what I mean? Um, when they did come in, they didn't come through these alleyways at first. They used to just blow a hole through the wall and just come through like if they wanted a house that was like next to this one. They would just blow a hole through the wall with a tank and then come in, like just storm it. But that's about it. And um, what they started doing is when they would come in, they would come in civilian clothing and they would try and label the, the streets so that they can get an idea of the, the way the, you know, the alleyways work. Cause, we, I would get lost in here. I mean, let's walk down and then we can show you. the windows are. Mm -hmm. People will tell you, you can hear when people are having sex. Yeah. You can hear when people, you know, you can smell what your neighbors cook in. Yeah. You hear every conversation. There's no hiding anything in these camps. Look at these two buildings. I mean, some of them are even closer than this one. This is actually quite spacious. One Palestinian family led us into their original UN shelter to see what the houses were like. This is a UN house here. You see this uh, mm -hmm. white and red. Oh, okay. So this is an original, uh, original uh, house. So after the tents, they got houses like this. There was literally this, you see this white block here, and that, that white block without the top part. And it was just like that. And that was their kitchen, their living room, you know, their bedroom. So this was a kitchen, she said, and then that was the room that they lived in, all 10 of them. Wow. A bunch of foreigners Everyone living in your house in Haifa. He's from a village next to Haifa yeah. uh, that they cleared out. And um, it's just it, it's just crazy to think they had to live in this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. In this little, it looks like a prison. I'm sorry, like, you know what I mean? Who the fuck would, like, imagine, like, with 10 kids. I mean, eight kids, it was eight kids and, and their parents, but that's, like, that's nuts. Yeah. You can imagine the chaos. Everywhere we went in Palestine, there were pictures of people either killed or jailed by Israeli forces. Here in Balata camp, they were plastered on almost every wall. So all this writing is when somebody comes out of jail. Um, you know, they celebrate them. Uh, you know, we have a lot of political prisoners. So when they come out, they'll put their flags up, depending what faction they're with. We might pass something that you'll see. Like here, you've got Fateh. You see mm -hmm, the... Mm -hmm. And then they'll hang the flags, they'll write on the walls, welcoming them home. The whole camp will come out and welcome them home to make them look like heroes so that they don't feel the absolute despair of going to jail because most of everybody goes to jail here. Forty percent of Palestinian men in the West Bank are jailed in their lifetime, and protesting is illegal under Israeli law. Even throwing stones at occupation forces can carry up to a 20-year prison sentence. One of the hotbeds of stone throwing is Aida refugee camp, a dystopian place ironically located inside of Bethlehem, known as the birthplace of Jesus Christ. A huge apartheid wall snakes alongside it to separate Palestinians from entering Jerusalem. The wall not only separates generations of families, but blocks their ability to harvest their olive trees, one of the only ways they can provide for them. 
This super militarized occupation of a sacred area is illegal under international law, and its flagrant crimes are only protected because of the backing of the U.S. Empire. Despite carrying out mostly non-violent resistance against their occupiers, refugees in Aida camp are constantly brutalized by Israeli forces. Oh, and see him. Take the camera and go inside now, right now. I need to see my son. Don't push me. Don't push me. Don't push me. Today, the camp houses over 5,500 refugees, mostly from Jerusalem and Hebron, who are packed into an area less than 0.04 square miles. A huge key of return proudly defines the main entrance to the camp. Resident of the camp and activist Munther Amira showed me around to understand what life is like as a refugee living under occupation. We are touched by the, the occupation on a daily basis. Uh, it is not easy to live under occupation. You will be targeted, your family will be targeted, the children will be targeted. Everything here, even, even our trees are targeted. If you will see here, like when they arrested a little child, I was just trying to tell them he was six years old, telling them he was afraid. You can see it in his face. So very high event officer came and he asked me, where is your house? And he pointed to my house. This is your house. We can see it from there. He asked me how many children you have. I told him that I have five children. So he told me, this will be the last time we will speak with you. The second time we will act. For me, maybe for the first day, the second day, the third day, I spent like one week just thinking, yes, I am going through this struggle. But what about my children, my wife? Because they, they targeted my, my house before and my roof was burned off. But if they will target my children, what can I do for them? Mm -hmm. So they're trying to threat the children, their parents. The message was, was clear. Or to live here as a slave and to shut your mouth and not to, to speak about anything, the shortage of water, killing people, taking, confiscating your land, demolishing your houses, or to leave this, this area, that's it. I think that they want to kill any kind of hope, any kind of life here, killing Abdurrahman. Before nine, 10 months, Abdurrahman was playing here, like any other kids, they, they, he was playing here. Abdurrahman was dressing his uniform, his school uniform. He was carrying his bag and he was playing here, just right here. He got a bullet from the other side of, uh, of the camp, from, from that military basement. The bullet came just into his heart and he was killed. I, I think it was a message for us. They can kill anyone close to the area, but, but they pick Abdurrahman. He was 13 years old. He was very, very small. And they just killed him to send a message. You don't have even the right to dream or the right to play, the right to move, any human rights that you can imagine. So we will continue our life. We will continue our struggle. If, if not because of our rights, because of Abdurrahman. Let's go. Wherever you go in the camp, you're in the shadow of a 30-foot concrete wall, segmented by towers.
the idea behind this war to kill the life of the Palestinian people, bringing them in big jails. This wall yani, separates between us and our families inside. This wall, wall separates between us and our dreams. This wall separates between us and the whole world. Some of our activists try to, to demolish part of the space. They just do very small hole like this. Everyone spent six months in the Israeli jails because causing damage on this wall. But they came and they just start sending tear gas toward the whole camp. Anuha Katamish was 42 years old, but she was sick. She was very he heavy. Seven tear gas came into her house, and she, try she tried to move. She couldn't because of the gas. She could not even take her breath, and she fell down, and she died. So this is what we call collective punishment. This is a typical Palestinian house. If we would count, we would have so many people here, more than 70 people. But if we came to the roots, the grandfather and the grandmother used to live in a tent here, here. Abu Sharif and Tib Sharif. They lived so, for so many years in the tent here until the Norwa came and started building shelters. Shelters is a concrete houses here. After that, it started being you know, the, the space was so small. So they start building uh, the first floor. Their children came and built another two floors. Their grandchildren start building another floor till they, they reach the fifth floor now with more than 70 people. Eight of its residents, they paid more than 24 years on the Israeli jails resisting the, the wall, building the wall. And it was so easy because it's very close to the wall. If someone threw stones toward the, the Israeli jeep, they will run here and they will take someone. Even if he did nothing, they will just arrest him. From the home's rooftop, you can see the true dominance of the wall. A massive expanse of green space is the precious restricted area. An Israeli settlement looms beyond the fortification. They came here to put the borders. They considered this separation wall as a borders of Israel. But if we would go back to also agreement, it have to be inside here. At least we are speaking about seven kilometers uh, in a village called Beit Safafa. It's after after this uh, mountain. So the idea bringing the the, the borders inside Bethlehem. This is one of the stories. The other thing. I would speak about personal stories, humanitarian, I would say, stories, like with the Darwish family, who they are living there. The Darwish family is a part of the, of the camp here. Uh, they are refugees, which means that they have to get their services from the camp. Imagine, now they are inside Israel, inside Jerusalem, on, inside the borders of Jerusalem, but they could not have their services from Jerusalem. Imagine their children used to come to the school here with less than five minutes. Now, if they want to go to school, they have to go inside Jerusalem, coming back to that checkpoint, coming inside Bethlehem, and after that, they can come to Aida, which takes them sometimes between two hours, two and a half hours. It's according to the security situation and sometimes imagine that they could not have a permission or they will be blocked here or they, they, will, they will be blocked inside the, the wall so they could not have a normal life anymore no one from the camp can uh, visit them we used to play there since we were kids we used to play here there on this yard and now it's closed, we could not go. And our children, they are blocked inside the streets in the camp. So it's spread so many 
daily things that we used to, to have happiness of. Were there other families that moved that were isolated like they were and had them more yeah. forced out? On yeah. the other side there we can see Jado's family. Mm -hmm. But they came and they confiscate another house if you saw that house. Mm -hmm. And they, they did it as a yeshiva, an mm -hmm. Orthodox Jewish school. They left mm -hmm. all this open area and they came inside Bethlehem so as to put their yeshiva. There are only two schools in Aida camp and no health facilities. Resources are tightly managed by occupation forces. Things we take for granted, like access to water, is severely restricted. Imagine your water, they are controlling it and they are giving the water for you. So we, we have to fill our tanks. We had twice a month water. So we had to fill our tanks and after that using the, the, the water. While on the Israeli colonies, they have a continuous pipe of water mm -hmm. that they don't have to fill uh, tanks. Imagine yourself, you want just to clean to clean up at the morning or to have a shower. That's it. You don't have water. And it caused so many problems, not just a political problems, a social problems. You are living under stress. You can see this guy, he's filling the water because he he lost. He ran out. Yeah, the water ran out. Why why do you think that they're not letting you guys have your own water supply? As I told you from the beginning, controlling us. They are controlling the air. They are controlling the land. They are controlling us. Rachel's tomb, a holy site for Christians, Jews, and Muslims, has been walled off into a military zone by Israeli forces who surround the area with checkpoints and guard towers. From Jewish or, or Christians or Muslims even, it has to be respected. And always we used to, to be there looking at the people cere celebrating there. For, for us, it was a normal thing. It started being abnormal when they start building the wall. It started being, uh, you know, a sign of hatred, not a sign of living together. So all the, now all the demonstrations start being around this area because it starts being a military zone. Uh, it starts being uh, a place for settlers, uh, a place which so many people were killed from these towers that surround it. What is your response to people who say it's just for security, they had to put it up um, to protect everyone's security? I would say we lived here 50 years ago. We spent the 50 years uh, responsible on this area. No one even tried to throw a stone toward Rashidon. This structure is the shelters that we spoke about before. The shelters that the owner was start building since the 50s, after 1956. Moving from living in a tent to live in a concrete houses was one of the biggest faults that we fall down. That happened with the Palestinian people. Living in a tent means that you are living in a temporary way. When you say that this was one of the worst things that Palestinians could do, is it because partly that the world stopped seeing you guys as refugees once you had a concrete shelter? Yes, it is one of the bad decisions that we accept living in these these uh, concrete houses because on a tent you are go you you would continue always putting pressure so as to return back. Now, yes, we are putting pressure, but the people who are looking, they will say, yes, they are living a good life. 
living 70 years under the occupation and 70 years as a, a refugee. And the refugee issues is not just living in a tent, being far away from the place that you you belong for. We, you know, it's very hard to translate, but my mother used to sing for the for for my village Diraban. If you when she was singing for the band, she, she used to cry. Even for me, I, I start crying for the band. Even I did not live there. But I feel something inside me that, you know, take me there. That I don't, you know, I don't belong for here. I belong for their band. This huge machine of violence that they are using against us, uh, killing our people, they could not even accept to, to resist in a non-violent way. They could not, you know, have the idea that someone will act against the occupation. They don't want you to act in any way, peacefully, non-violent, un unarmed, armed, anything. So even the non-violent way that we are using, they could not accept it. Because of that, they are putting pressure on us. On the other side, even with our people, when you are trying to convince them to go in a non-violent way, looking at the atmosphere around, it's very hard that they are killing us in a daily basis. In Gaza 2014, they killed more than 2,500 people. Even uh, by the beginning of, of October till now, they killed more than 200 young people in, 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 in the West Bank. So even our people start looking at us, what you are doing. The Israeli forces have tried to strangle every means the people have to protest. But in Munter's camp, and in all of the 19 refugee camps in the West Bank, they have no choice but to resist the occupation and the imperial forces behind it. What's happening here, I will not speak just about Palestine in the Middle East. Everyone wants to have, to control this, this area. Uh, we have very bad people who are representing Islam through ISIS or through all these people. And on the other side, we have the American policies that brought these people to the, you know, to the top of the, the political life in the Middle East. The, 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 the message of Islam, like the message of uh, Christianity, it is a message of peace. It has to be a message of peace. This is my understand of, of religion, of any religion, uh, Islam, uh, uh, Judaism, and Christianity. This is, this is the message of religion. And from the other side, uh, the political message from any government, if they want to, to, to participate, to have peace, not on this way, not to control the resources of the people, not to control the, the freedom of the people. The support of the American government Israel, by its resources, they could not build this huge wall without the donation of the Americans, of the American government. They, will, they could not build, not the settlements and not the, 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 this separation wall, which killed the Palestinian life. Why do you think it is uh, that only 15% of Americans sympathize with this plight? I mean, it's so obvious being here what the reality really is. But yet, Americans have no idea. It looks like that there is a war between civilized people and uncivilized people. It's, it's not truth. This is the idea that, that it's not a, a, a war between, between Muslims or, uh, and uh, Jewish or between uh, civilized people and uncivilized people. It, it, this war is between occupation and occupiers. We were occupied here. This is the thing. And we are fighting for our freedom. This is an illegal occupation under international law. And these refugees have the absolute right to return. But Israel's hyper-militarized subjugation of refugees that have next to nothing, except the stones they sometimes throw, reveals something very telling. That Israel is absolutely terrified of their plight being heard by the world. Here in this biblical land, a real story of David and Goliath can be found where the Palestinian people, however outmatched by might, can defeat this giant.